Today's sermon is Judas, answer to prayer. Judas, answer to prayer. And just to give us some points of reference as we prepare to turn to uh, the Holy Scripture, let me give you three. These are the simplified versions. Um, number one, pray for providence. Number one, pray for providence. And children, I can tell you providence means what God sees, what God plans. Pray for what God plans and what God knows and for God's will to be done. That's what that's saying, okay? Number one, pray for providence. If you cannot remember anything else, remember to pray for God's providence and to trust in God's providence. He's got a plan. Number two, this is something I'll probably come back to uh, as we move through football season in the fall, portal problems. The scripture is going to remind us that we have portal problems, portal problems. If, you, if you're watching online in maybe uh, India or People's Republic of China, I'm going to come back and explain this, but briefly, portal, in our country at the college level system, there's a transfer portal where players can change teams. So number two, the scripture is going to remind us that we do have on this earth portal problems. It is not just about football and baseball and basketball players at the collegiate level. Portal problems, the transfer portal. And number three, providence prevails. Even with all the portal problems that may happen briefly here on earth, providence prevails. With that in mind, let's turn to our scripture today. We're going to begin turning again to the passage to which we've looked now for three Sundays, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. And then we'll go on to Luke chapter 22 as well with some selected verses. Now it came to pass in those days, he, this means Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray. And he spent the night in prayer with God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he called or named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James of Alphaeus, that is James son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas of James, that's Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Now, the feast of unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was drawing near. And the chief priests and scribes were seeking how they could put him, this means Jesus, to death, because they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, the one called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed, conferred with the chief priests and captains of the temple, temple guard, how he could hand him, hand Jesus, over to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. Now, then picking up at verse 39, Jesus is going out now from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. And having come out, he went according to his custom to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and falling to his knees, he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples 
and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise, pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd, and one called Judas, one of the twelve leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Judas said to him, But Jesus said to him, Judas, with a kiss, you betray the Son of Man? And then to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So again, the simple one, two, three on this. Um, children, youth, y'all, we can all track with this now. Number one, pray for providence. Pray for God's plan. God can see. God has a plan. Pray for providence. Number two, the reality. There are portal problems in this world, and not just in the NCAA. There are portal problems, the transfer portal. People change teams. Number three, providence prevails. A little bit deeper version, and this is the one that's in your sermon notes in the bulletin, if you're following along here. Number one, prayer. Prayer is a faithful choice, a faithful choice and a faithful act. In many ways, it's the deepest and most faithful thing you can do in response to God. Prayer, faithful choice. It is a declaration of dependence on God's plan and grace. You know, on July 4th, we're going to celebrate our national declaration of independence but what i'm telling you is from a faith perspective we are called to a declaration of dependence i've preached that in sermons before so that's not the title of today's sermon and we're talking about judas today for a while so it's kind of a different angle but declaration of dependence if you think you're running your life you're probably too busy to pray you're only going to pray if you come to the end of your line and everything hasn't worked that you thought was going to work but if from the get-go you would turn to God and say, you're in charge today. Even if I think I'm on top of the world and know what I'm doing, I actually don't. You're the one who knows. I'm going to look to your providence, your plan, not mine. Turn to God and uh, pray. It's a faithful choice, declaration of dependence on God's plan and God's grace. Number two, there are personal choices that everyone makes in this life. Personal choices and it's not just an individual, you're talking about multidimensional because everybody is affecting everybody else. You know, there's a whole web of, you know, cause and effect going on here. So we're talking about the personal choices of multiple parties and they all matter. But they ultimately lead to this thing, everyone will stand before the judgment seat of the Lord individually, okay? So individual responsibility. And then number three, good news, God's plan, God's providential grace will prevail. Do you believe that? I want you to believe that. I want you to know that, okay? No matter what, no matter what happens in number two, in all the personal choices and all the transfer portals going on, God's plan will prevail. So today we're going to talk about... um, surprising answers to prayers. Sometimes we think the the formula on prayer is as long as I'm a good boy and I pray pretty well, that means that God is going to do exactly what I direct him to do or exactly what I anticipate and it's all going to be very obvious. Every day, every season in life will be exactly obvious because I prayed about it. No, that's not the way it works. The Bible never tells you that. The Bible tells you actually the opposite of that. There are going to be a lot of times when I can't understand and when I prayed for this and it looks like everything's going in that direction, okay? Surprising answers to prayers. Just a little nod here. This is not going to be a historic sermon on Benedict Arnold, but I did want to bring him up. You know, Benedict Arnold in our nation's history is pretty much our closest parallel to the Judas story. Remember, great hero, 
great hero of the American Revolution for uh, four and more years. I mean, we may not even have made it to Yorktown if you don't have Benedict Arnold taking the guns at Ticonderoga, right, in 1775, being basically the most courageous of all the generals of George Washington for several years. We do not win Saratoga, clearly, without Benedict Arnold. This is why he gets promoted to major general. You know, badly injured, his leg badly injured. I mean, this is a courageous hero for several years in the cause of the revolution. But then things go a different direction for any number of reasons. Slights, uh, the radicals in Pennsylvania, including the governor, having it out to get, you know, Benedict Arnold. And then on his side, the fact that he um, falls in love with Peggy Shippen, who happens to be from a loyalist family and a very wealthy family, and he doesn't have enough money to make her happy. All kinds of things going on. So the, all the revolutionary, you know, personalities involved and his own, you know, you, you marry somebody and it kind of changes your life a little bit. Did y'all know that? Well, anyway, so all, all of a sudden we, we fast forward to 1780. Uh, George Washington has put Benedict Arnold, who's still recovering from his injuries, um, as the commander of West Point. That critically, at this, at this stage of the war, critical location. And Benedict Arnold, it turns out, makes plans to surrender the fort to the British for a price and will be brought over under the British uh, as a brigadier general. Well, you know, the, the plan is exposed, Benedict Arnold flees, he does become a, a, a brigadier general uh, with the British Army and becomes the most hated person in early American history. And his name is, like kind of Judas, synonymous with traitor. But let's remember, there were thousands and hundreds of thousands of American patriots praying every day for God's will for God's purposes for the revolution, and probably a lot of them praying for one of our greatest heroes, Benedict Arnold. In 1779, Lord help Benedict Arnold to continue to recover so he can help lead us to independence, right? Their prayers weren't answered exactly the way they thought. What about in your own life? Have you had prayers where, how did that come out of this prayer? How did my prayer for this child or for this friend or for this business associate end up looking like this, right? Think about your own life. You know, sometimes we don't have the answers, do we? Sometimes we're reminded to fall on our knees in humility before God and understand, I am not God. Your pastor, your mom, your grandmom, sometimes does not know either. I have to tell you all this. Sometimes I have no idea how God is going to use this, but I'm called to trust that he will. So, number one again, prayer. A faithful choice, it's your way of declaring to God, I'm dependent on you. I'm trusting in you. I'm going to trust in your plan, God, which I cannot understand right now, and your grace. So Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, but remember he's incarnate now. He's emptied himself. He's taken on the form and the very being of one of us. He's in the flesh. He spent the night in prayer with God. Jesus, as you'll remember, teaches us as disciples to pray this, your kingdom come, speaking to God the Father, your will be done. Not my will be done, and here's my will, God, and make sure it happens, because I do call on your name. No, no, no. Your will be done. You wonder what the direction was with Jesus' prayer with the Father that night. Praise all night. We, we're not told. You have to wonder, though, and now this is not in the Bible. This is just kind of Martin kind of thinking about this. If Jesus at various points said, really? Him? He's going to be the number seven apostle? Really him? And you certainly, surely have to imagine something like that as a possibility when you get to number 12. Judas, Father? Judas. Really? Judas. 
Yes, Judas. It brings us forward, of course, and we will be back here whenever we arrive here, working through the final chapters of Luke's Gospel to the Mount of Olives, or specifically, as we know, Gethsemane, when Jesus prays, asking the Father to take the cup of the Father's wrath on sin and judgment away from him. And then he says, nevertheless, Jesus prays, not my will, but yours. You have to wonder, actually, if when Jesus and the Father were in conversation, he had some questions about you. Really? You want me to save him? He gets to be in the kingdom too? She does? You want me to call her unto myself? Did you ever think about that? wonder what the conversation was like when you were brought before the decision. So Jesus spent the night in prayer with God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he also named apostles. These are his ambassadors, and these are the ones who are going to be closest to him in personal communion. Number two, personal choices of multiple parties matter. It's not just about you and God. There's all kinds of other people involved in this story. Your siblings, your friends, your enemies, <laughs> all kinds of people in this story. So when you read through Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, there is a big clunker at the end of that passage, right? After all this all-night prayer and all these ones being named, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now let's notice that. I'm going to ask you to fill in the blank. You should be able to fill in the blank pretty easy easily. Judas Iscariot, who what? A traitor? Who was always a traitor? Who was known to be a traitor? Who was already working against Jesus as a traitor at this time? No. Who what? Became. There was a process in which Judas plays a major part. Do you hear what I'm saying? Luke who in many ways is the best writer among certainly the first three gospel writers on certain of these nuances, is the one who doesn't just say, Judas Iscariot the traitor. He says, Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. There's a process, there are choice and turns that you make, that your children make, that your grandchildren make, that everybody makes, okay? And you become in the process. Judas became a traitor. Uh, which brings us back to the portal problems. People get tempted to change teams. Did you know that? And not just college basketball players, and not just because of NIL. There are other temptations and other, other things going on. The transfer portal. Luke 22, verse 3. Then Satan entered into Judas, the one called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. Well, what is going on here? I'll turn to Klaus Schilder, whose excellent, you know, trilogy includes Christ and his suffering. And in that book, what Schilder says is really helpful here. It is the peculiar majesty of Jesus that he can conquer man without man's first approaching him. But Satan's frailty is proved by this, that he cannot approach a soul unless that soul has first turned to him. Judas made a turn. Satan is not omnipotent. Satan has limited powers, and in this case, it takes two to tango on this move that is made here. You have to have Judas making a move and Satan will respond. Um, Alfred Plummer's critical exegetical commentary of the gospel according to Luke says this, there is no hint that Judas is like an ammoniac, unable to control his own actions. Judas opened the door to Satan, 
Judas did not resist Satan, and Satan certainly did not flee from Judas. Satan was delighted to enter into an arrangement with Judas and to take Judas over. So this brings us back to this issue, the portal problem. Raises these questions. You know, we're not given all the answers with Judas, but it raises a question with everybody who makes these kind of decisions. What's your problem? Judas had problems with what was going on with Jesus. We know this. You know, the whole treasurer thing and the, uh, you know, the wasting of money to glorify Jesus, that, that issue. What's your plan? What's your proposition? And what's your price? That's, that's the issue with Judas. You know, what's his problem? What's his proposition? And what's his price? And it is with everyone when we're tempted to turn away from the Lord to idolatry and ultimately to Satan. Luke 22, verse 4 and 5 tell us this, And he, Judas, went away and discussed with the chief priests and captains of the temple guard, the officers of the temple guard, by implication, that's what that's talking about, how he could hand Jesus over to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. Now let's take a look at this. The Greek here indicates that this is bargained as a mutual deal. This is a mutual deal that is negotiated, negotiated, and in effect conspired upon between Judas and these leaders, the chief priest and the ones who run the temple guard, which is necessary to arrest and take Jesus. And then the agreement was to give him money. That Greek there, Argyrion, is like for silver, okay? Silvery money. He's going to get silver coins. You can bank on that. You know, bank on that. That's Judas's proposition and price. Do you have a proposition and a price? What tempts you to turn on Jesus and enter the transfer portal? If there's anything that you acknowledge, I'm going to encourage you to pray for God's help to lead you away from that. So number three, now we have God's plan and providential grace, and they do prevail. We know, Paul says, that God causes all things, not just the good things, all things. Y'all see that? God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We need to remember that verse. Children, you need to know this verse, that no matter what is happening in your life, God can work through it. When you're loved by God, when you love God and are called according to his purpose, you can use anything. Remember Joseph? Joseph, back in the Old Testament, his brother's sell him into slavery. Most of them want to kill him, okay? Judas steps in and and says, let's just sell him as a slave. He ends up down for years as a slave in Egypt. And then many years later, uh, this is the second time, Joseph has basically already said this the first time when his dad's still alive. But when his dad dies, when Jacob dies, and the brothers are fearful that now the hammer or the ax is going to fall on them, They come to Joseph, and Joseph says, as for you, to his brothers now, who were so horrible to him, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. God worked through what Judas did for your salvation. Amen? In Peter's Pentecost sermon, in Acts chapter 2, he says this, This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, 
loosing the pangs of death. In other words, God worked through this. All the betrayal, all the hostility against Jesus, God used it for his plan of salvation. It's incredible. This, this is what we are supposed to remember. This is the big story that all our little stories, when we're struggling with things, we're called to remember this. Even when we're betrayed and handed over, right? Acts 2, verse 36, then, Let all the house of Israel therefore know, know this for certain, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You crucified him? God worked with that to bring about his glorious salvation. So now, let's go back to the Mount of Olives. Jesus prays this, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In agony, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like great drops of blood. Judas. What answer to Jesus' prayer did he get at the Mount of Olives? Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You ever heard about people say, well, my prayers aren't answered. You could look at this passage and say, well, Jesus' prayers weren't answered. I mean, look at what he asked for, and then he asked for God's will, and certainly Judas then interrupting the scene can't be God's will. Oh, yeah? So almost immediately after Jesus is praying that and then awakening his disciples that they would pray that they would not enter into the trial or to temptation, there's Judas. Behold, Judas leading this group. There's your answer. There it is. So we're called pray for providence. Deal with the reality. Be aware of the reality of the portal problem. Okay? People change teams. People have choices. But it's all under God's ultimate sovereignty. And so we pray for protection and perseverance. Now, I've added this one in. You'll notice I'm going to four this time. You and I need to pray for, here's some other Ps, protection and perseverance. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this. Be sober-minded and be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Let me just recommend to you, don't enter the transfer portal with Judas. He's going to tell you the other team has a lot of great options. Do not change teams, okay? The devil is prowling around. He's looking for anybody else today? I got some great deals over here. Jesus says this, pray that you may not enter into temptation or trial. So pray. Acknowledge the fact that you and I are vulnerable, okay? It's what the scripture is telling us. So we need to pray for spiritual protection and for perseverance through temptation. And then, so that's number three now. And number four, back to ultimately praise God providence prevails. God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. Trust in that. Benedict Arnold, Judas, God can deal with that. God can deal with their choices. God can deal with people who have harmed you. God can work through all of those things to bring about his glory and his ultimate saving purposes in your life for everyone who loves him, for everyone who belongs to Jesus. Now and forever, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's, we hope let's you join enjoyed this today. sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.